Hey, everybody. Hey. I let this problem bother me. This book on dialogue I put out a couple years ago to help tell the world that I think there's a problem about the way we're confronting the problems that we're dealing with. It requires dialogue. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. I am from Montreal. And Montreal is the ice hockey capital of the world. And when somebody bothers you in that culture, you drop your gloves, and you flick your helmet off, and you dare them to fight. And I realized that's not probably the best way to solve problems and negotiate a better outcome around the world. Good leadership is very much measured by the results of your decisions, right? The KPIs, the bottom line results, the top line results, the sustainability of your organization, the stickiness of your customers, the talent wants to work with you and stay in your university and not go somewhere, somewhere else. Those are all the measures, but you only get there if you actually have good dialogue. And there's a problem. The problem, of course, is that we have this issue called dialogue gap. Now, a little bit of education. I like to refer to what I'm doing right now as communication. I'm sending messages. And we communicate more than at any time in human history. Right? We're texting, we're doing PowerPoints, we're watching YouTubes. And that's good, but it's not what's needed all the time. Dialogue is different. Dialogue is when you sit in a circle and you think together. And we've been doing dialogue since the start of time. You know, we sit in a circle in a cave and say, oh my god, there's a dinosaur. What do we do? <laughs> and it's only in the last generation that we don't do that. We sit in front of our cubicle and our screen and we text or we Google the solution. We need both. But the challenge is, as we uh, travel around the world, I've been to now, I think, almost 60 countries. Everywhere around the world, we're the same. We want to be more happy, less sad, grow our profits, reduce our losses, uh, have less conflict, more sustainability, you know, get rid of the decline, and grow our organization. But how do we do it? We need the dialogue to do it. But if we have dialogue gap, there's a problem. So, a few solutions and a little bit of an educational point. Negotiation is very much about how can you get more for what you want versus how much can I get for what I want. So on the chart behind me, you know, you get more, I get less, we're maybe at point A. I get more, you get less, maybe around point B. And, and I can teach you some tactics that will make you effective at getting more at what you want. And you'll go up and down that line somewhere. And perhaps, as we see, trying to work things out around the world, at, at work, at home, and, and also in society, you're going to erupt into conflict, and you're not going to get that best outcome. But I'm very much inspired by the work of John Nash. He got the Nobel Prize for proving that you can actually get a better outcome. He's the one that came up with the idea of equilibrium point, the, the point at which no one party can get more without somebody losing something. The challenge, is, of course, is how do you get to that point, that point C. So how do you grow the pie before you split the pie? That's all of our challenge, regardless of what we're trying to achieve here or anywhere else in the world. And that is a bit of a challenge. So I've studied that, and I've worked on that with all my clients all over the world. And we found that the elements of optimal outcomes can be broken into five key areas. First, you need to engage all the stakeholders. Second, you need to make sure your dialogue includes all the key issues. Third, you need to manage the dialogue in the right way. Fourth, you need to do it at the right time. And fifth, you need to create a space in which this dialogue and these solutions can emerge. And uh, I just want to give you a bunch of examples from around the world. The first one, a government example. Uh, I was part of an international team of business people invited to Saudi Arabia to discuss how could we bring foreign direct investment to create employment in Saudi Arabia, one of the rapidly growing uh, male population, young, uh, you know, and, and young guys. I know uh, if we have free time, we get up to trouble, and so you need to create employment. So very much like we're here today, we were brought into a theater, we were presented to, and uh, they were hoping that we would invest. But the way that the, the uh, communication was conducted was very much uh, presentation as opposed to a dialogue. If they had them sat us down in smaller groups and had a, a, a chance to sit and think together and discuss, you know, why would we invest in this country versus another country? What, would, what prevents us from wanting to go to Saudi Arabia? And how can we overcome those? 
That way would have led to more of the issues. If we had a different way, we'd know the issues. If you know the issues, you can get to the, a better outcome. Dancing around uh, the world, uh, last summer we were invited to Brazil. Fantastic country, lots of energy, lots of things happening. One thing that had never happened before, the people went into the streets and started protesting about the government increase in the, in the bus fares. And the government had no experience with people protesting in Brazil. And what was interesting was, in this particular case, because they had not engaged the people, they didn't really understand the level of discontent that was just below the surface, and which erupted when the government won and started spending hundreds of millions of dollars on the World Cup and the Olympics. So by engaging the people in the conversation, it was much easier then for the government to surface the <laughs> issues and then to find the way forward. And to give full credit to Brazil, they are one of the best in the world for something called participatory budgeting, which is including people like you and me into how the government spends its budgets. And that's an interesting thing for the rest of the world to learn about. Government also talks to government. And uh, this time last year, I was given the opportunity to visit in, to Iran. And you know the world's changed quite dramatically in the last year in Iran. And one of the things that they've done is to create a space to uh, allow for dialogue on the issues that matter. Uh, so again, they brought uh, a bunch of us to Iran. We addressed the top thousand business people. And over the course of a couple of days, we had lots of opportunity to dialogue, to discuss the issues that really made a difference, and to find ways that they could open up to the rest of the world. And since that time, and we don't take any credit for it, the government has created a space to open dialogue with the United States, with Israel, and the rest of the world. And uh, we hope to welcome Iran back into the international group of nations. Fantastic opportunity. So governments are important in our lives, but business are also important in our lives. And when businesses talk to business, they come together in two places. One is they come together when they're buying and selling services from each other. And the second is for investment. And it's interesting. We worked with a very large organization around the procurement of IT services. They spend billions and billions of dollars on IT services. And they found that every time they came to the table to manage this uh, procurement practice, the sales side were far more trained and experienced than the buy side. So all we did was introduce some techniques to help the buyers negotiate better. By changing the way they went about it and by helping them learn about the issues, they ended up getting much, much better value for money. They didn't necessarily push the price down, but they got a whole lot more value for the spend. And if you're spending a billion US dollars, that value can be very significant. Companies also have a hard time when they talk to themselves. So in this next example, uh, what we're talking about here is a, a company that has been around for hundreds of years and that uh, recognized that just around the corner, very disruptive change was going to happen. And this disruptive change is what you all do and love. An app was going to be developed to go onto their smartphones that could easily wipe out the company's business. Now the company's smart, right? They had teams of people who were hired, who were working to find ways to solve this problem and even to capitalize on this disruptive change. The problem, however, was that the way they engaged the people was not as good as it could have been. So even though they had teams of people who could predict the problem that was going to happen, they didn't give them a seat at the table in the boardroom, and the boardroom didn't listen to what they had to say. And as a result, the company today is much less than it was even a year ago, and the direction is not positive. Sad, right? In that particular case, they had the people who knew the issues, but they didn't create a way for the messages to filter through the organization to the top. Telemanagement, another area where we're all very interested. Companies talk to employees. Uh, it goes well if it's held at the right time. If it's held at the wrong time and the wrong way, people say, well, this company doesn't care about me. This organization doesn't care. And they move on. And that's the big challenge today. Global chase for talent. Right? We all want to get great jobs, we want to work in great organizations. If we're not having those conversations that inspire us to stay, people leave. And so everyone's got to become much better at managing that. And uh, just a last example, 
I think we'd all agree the hardest conversations we have are with family. And in my experience, the hardest conversations are not just with family, but in family businesses. And in this particular case, uh, I was asked for advice by somebody who wanted, uh, he was the business owner, he wanted to fire his father-in-law. <laughs> and the harder he tried, the more his wife wanted to divorce him. <laughs> Apparently, she was even going to leave with the dog. So it was a problem, right? And what we did was to introduce other issues. What he was failing to see as the owner of the business was the issues that would affect the, the honor and the face of the father-in-law. It was clearly time for him to move on, but by opening up that discussion on the issues, then other ways could come into place to make the transition at the top of that organization. So I know some of you are wondering, what are key ways that we can improve our dialogues? We've uh, studied world literature, and through that study and also experience, we found that there's about 50 different behaviors. They fall into five categories. First of all, we need to be better at expressing ourselves. Some cultures, American cultures, for example, versus Asian cultures, are better at expressing themselves in conflict and public situations. right? And so you need to have ways that can manage the cultural differences. Expression's important. If you get it on the table, you can deal with it. The second one, absorbing, which is much more than just listening. It's very much also reading your, reading the body language, listening to your gut, your intuition, listening to yourself. It's so important that if you absorb the messages, that you're able to pick up what the other party is saying in the dialogue. And they might be silent, but body language never stops talking. So it's an important one to remember. Uh, the next category, and I put them together, respect and suspending. We need to respect diversity. And here's why. You know, it's International Women's Day. So if there's any disrespect for gender, for age, for social standing, for the university you've come from, for the uh, financial background that you bring to the table, whatever it is that causes this gap between you and the other side, What's going to be noticed is that they don't feel respected by you. And if you don't respect them, they're going to stop talking. And if they stop talking, you don't get the issues on the table. And if you don't get the issues on the table, you can't get the best outcome. So it's critically important to respect the other side. It's also critically important that you suspend your assumptions, your beliefs, and uh, that you open up a space that allows for you to understand where are they coming from because it's important to understand their perspective. And if we fail to do that, then people who are highly qualified, highly trained, find that's the hardest of all the, the five. So we have to suspend. And we even have to suspend our egos right, in order to move forward. The last of the five categories is what I call presence. We need to be fully present. To be successful in dialogue, you have to be mindful. You have to stop multitasking. You have to focus on the other side. and in the so doing, you're going to be able to read the body language. You're, you're going to be able to suspend what you're thinking about and focus on where they're coming from and demonstrate the respect. Very, very important. There's also dozens and dozens of methods to manage the dialogue. So good dialogue leaders know that these methods exist and will choose different methodologies to manage the dialogue in the situation. So I need your help. I'm uh, appealing to you. We would love if you join the population around the world who are recognizing the need for dialogue, the, re the need to bring dialogue back into our conversations at work, at home, and in society. It's uh, my goal, my passion, it's become my life's drive to try to uh, bring training of dialogue into schools and universities and organizations. I think if we don't do it, we're going to have more of all the problems that we face because we can dialogue. Right? We're all in this together. We're all in this world together. We need to figure out how to live together. And to do that, we need to dialogue together better. So I'd like to uh, finish off just by daring you to dialogue. I'd like to dare you to dialogue. If you're a student or an employee and you think things can be improved where you are, I dare you to dialogue. If you are a consumer and you'd like to improve a product or a service that you're buying, I dare you to dialogue. 
But a lot of my work actually is at the other side of the table. If you're a boss or if you're a leader and you think everything's fine, I dare you to dialogue. <laughs> if you think that your government is doing a great job managing the situation, I dare you to dialogue. Because the optimal outcome is really the inspiration. That's what we're after. There's been a bit of theory, a bit of negotiation theory, a bit of psychology in my remarks. But if there's one thing I want you to remember, if you face any challenges at work, at home, or in your communities or around the world, just remember the solution is in the dialogue. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading.